nossa mesa de migrações e This is our panel on migrations. So I'm going to introduce our participants in a minute. Firstly, I want to say before we go into the panel itself, on the during the whole uh, period of our panel, you can access the Q and A to ask your questions or raise your hand to ask questions orally. And also, I want to let everyone know that we have simultaneous translation. So you can go to the globe at the bottom of your screen or the three dots that say more when you're uh, if you're on your phone or tablet so just that uh, initial housekeeping so firstly i want to i'm going to introduce our panelists first i'm going to introduce myself and tell you all a little bit about our panel. So, so this is the International Migrations, uh, Human Rights Violations, and Transnational Corporations. My name is Barbara Dybert. I am an Associate Professor of the Federal University of Juiz de Fora. I'm from Comparative Literature. I was the International Relations Director of the institution in the last five years. And I work with cultural studies, comparative literature, uh, di diaspora literature. And the question of silence. I had the honor and the pleasure of being part of HOMA this year. I started a dialogue, a debate, a transdisciplinary debate with colleagues from other areas, particularly from IR and law, with whom I have uh, much to exchange and there's much to grow uh, mutually. So I'm very happy to be here uh, as the coordinator of this line of research and I hope we have a good uh, seminar. So I'm going to read out uh, a text of introduction, okay? We've always been in movement since the beginning of human existence and when Homo sapiens understood that uh, they'd have to move to survive, we've um, faced the challenge of crossing lands and seas, deserts, with the promise of a promised land beyond Mount Sinai. Along the way, with maps that redesigned themselves, we stepped on glaciers uh, where we were able to cross the world from the mother continent, Africa, to America, crossing forests, savannas, with gatherings and uh, fights along the way that resulted in a multi-plural and rich pa panel of human beings of the contemporary world, where the idea of racial purity all the way from the caves has always been an impossibility. When we talk about international migrations, corporations and human rights in 2021, it's not just a movement that we're talking about. We're talking about a crisis, the biggest in all of the contemporary era, era that carries in itself the drama of separated families, uprooted, deterritorialized, de the sentiment of homelessness, the loss of the home that uh, were eternally condemned to seek without success. Along the way, the home was altered by others, uh, foreigners and strangers that here in my motherland arrived after me, or I was the one who came from a motherland and I'm no longer able to recognize, neither in exile nor when I occasionally return because the experience of migration has altered me. The migrant, this frightful, 
um, being in movement, a bridge between worlds and a point of contact with alterity whose existence I don't always want to remember, uh, opens windows to the perception that, that, that I've never been alone and the limits that define me are not so shut as I intended them to be. In the current world, the number of migrants keeps growing and we need to talk about this crisis, the hybrid place where they are and the priorities of an economic system that we created and that, that has become bigger than us, uglier than us, uglier than we wanted and worse than what we dreamed. The horror of Conrad inhabited by the stranger of Freud, that sentiment of fright, which is a familiar sentiment that makes us that takes us over when we recognize and don't recognize any longer our own motherland. Because as Kafka would say, even when we're home, the fact is that we're always in someone else's home. To take the example, the most recent example, um, we can see the videos of the migrants on the poland Belarus uh, border, Belarus border. The images are shocking because um, to make your life fit into two backpacks, to cross the world to a place where you're not you're not welcome, shouldn't be anybody's life project. In this case, the specific case, the last destination aimed for by those migrants is perhaps Germany, the heart of the European Union, that nobody knows how will continue to absorb the immigrants, especially from the Middle East, that um, are hiding in the cold forests of Poland and trying to cross the barbed wire fences. Germany has fear xenophobia that is still alive and latent with the recent trauma, but will be unable to solve a problem of this proportion or to absorb all those fleeing authoritarian governments and human humanitarian crises in the Middle East. For their part, the, the British think that they've solved the question of the crisis by leaving uh, the European Union, but they're also full of citizens from their former colonies, from their former empire where the sun never sets. For colonialism has its consequences. Over here on this side of the Atlantic, um, the cages continue to exist on the Mexico-US border, now with less media attention, but El Paso continues to be a place that is tense and full of rancor for those that are called the dirty ones. The multiple examples uh, are spread out, but we're only at the start of the crisis that should become enhanced in the current century, that is probably is likely to become enhanced. To the point that the borders of the Northern Hemisphere and of the West will have to be defended or reconfigured from one, one way or another, it will be the biggest war, symbolic or not, of the contemporary world. According to the latest survey of the UN in the International Migration 2020 Highlights Report formulated by the Department of uh, Economic Matters, Economic and Social Matters, of the UN, the global number of international mig migrants reached 281 million last year. 10 years ago, it was 221 million, which means that the number of international migrants grew mo more quickly than the international, than the world population in this century, representing today in absolute numbers, almost the number of the inhabitants of Indonesia, which is the fourth most populous country in the world. In this report, we read that the number of people um, dislocated uh, through across international borders, fleeing conflicts, persecution, violence, or human rights violations has doubled from 17 to 34 million in the last 20 years. The crisis in fact is deepening and may uh, be drawn on the world map. It comes in a wave that is south, north and east, west. So much so that two thirds of all international migrants live in just 20 countries. Um, the highlight being the United States that continue to be the preferential destination with 51 million migrants, 18% of the total of the population, Germany with 16 million and the UK with nine. Although the human experience of 
dislocation existed of movement existed since before uh, since prehistory it has reached numbers never before imagined and has become the greatest crisis of the current setting it's important it's urgent to ask what did we do or what did we fail to do to motivate hundreds of uh, people to put their lives into two backpacks and trying to cross a, a forest in a very uh, cold Polish winter with children and elderly, elderly uh, on their arms. What makes people, millions of people crossing the desert being transported by coyotes or risk having a son drown on the Mediterranean Sea? In this eighth seminar, the first in which we can participate with a panel specific for the migration research line, more than answers, we need to ask questions. So we will use what we will always have been able to do, which is movement. So let us move ourselves towards each other by listening and by dialogue in search of the question. How has the system failed? What mistake have we made? And hopefully along the way to an answer, maybe we can extend um, a hand of solidarity to those that are side by side with us, who also seek a map in which paths may be always recreated. Okay, so in this opening moment, I would like to introduce now, firstly, thank uh, everyone for coming. And I'd like to introduce our guests. We have very busy people here today who left their schedules aside uh, to join us here and share a little bit about this question, the spirit of walking together. So Professor Juan Hernandez Subizarreta, he holds a PhD in law from the University of the Basque Country, professor of uh, company law in the same university, member, member of the Center for the Studies on International Cooperation and Development. He has written several books and articles about various questions related to corporations and the crisis of regulatory systems. So, so the, the, the corporation with responsibility and is a, that's one of his books. And he's a coordinator of the Permanent Court of the People. So I'm very uh, glad to introduce Professor Juan Hernandez Zubizarreta, who now has the floor. Thank you, Barbara. I want to thank my colleagues from HOMA for the invitation because I want, I'm very pleased for the invitation and I want to greet my colleagues and all the participants. I'm going to present my talk with a few uh, key ideas, five, and the aim is to establish, let's say, a conceptual framework um, about the relations between corporate power and forced migration. So forgive me for this methodology. I'm going to try, I'm going to do my best to uh, stay within the 15 uh, minutes and also try to respect the interpreters by not being too speedy. So forced migration put us before a very tough question about the destruction of the international system of human rights. This is a tough statement to start off with because human, international human rights law is not only Fra fragile has made fra been made to become fragile 
but is entering a new phase of destruction, which requires a rapid intervention to put the brakes on that process. So the first idea is to relate forced migrations with the systemic crisis or the crisis of domination that the capitalist system is undergoing right now, as if we had a chain with various uh, steps, uh, uh, rather a chain with various links. And so this chain is surrounding uh, refugees and migrants and is submerging their rights, dr making their rights drown. So the capitalist model is having it, finding it difficult to keep the rate of accumulation and profits high for the elites. It's a crisis in the post pandemic has become sharper with price increases. So the deficiencies of the global supply chains. So it is a crisis of accumulation, a very strong one. There's a system of the financial system that does not produce anything, does not position itself. And there's a number of other obstacles uh, that, uh, that are called the hidden um, enemies of capitalism. We have environmental problems and also we are in a neo-colonial system. So this chain, as we said, the elites, the capital to keep their high level of profits, they radicalize their practices against uh, human rights, uh, peoples and nature to take this um, at two streams. We see how migrant people suffer with the model that understand them as people that do not produce, they do not consume, and therefore they are human waste. So we have the idea of putting these people aside, letting them to uh, die. Some of these people are uh, imprisoned, others are explored in the labor market of um, richer countries. And this is the first point. The second is how the corporate power acts again, human rights to different streams are three basic mechanisms. First, there's a deep uh, democratic crisis, uh, which is um, now seen as a global trend. We can speak of a neoliberal authoritarianism in the frontier of post-fascist uh, spaces with the extreme right-wing growing. And the deficiency of democracy can be evidenced by three points. First, democratic institutions, the classic democratic institutions are uh, suffering a deep disruption, the state of law, the separation of powers, and judicial um, authoritarianism. They no longer protect citizenship and uh, even less migrant people. The judicial protection uh, no longer exists. And we have the emergence of a global economic constitution that is not formalized by any text that constitutes a number of different um, rules in forms of contracts, contracts, um, court uh, sentences and different standards that are interweaved and overlap each other, leading to prof profound damages to the democratic uh, systems and their institutions. And finally, we have the architecture of impunity, uh, very strong uh, power 
belonging on the hands of corporations aiming at uh, destruction, not only weakening, but destruction of our rights of millions of people. And we are talking about migrant people. The fragility of the democratic systems used by the elites so uh, structural violence that uh, could be um, called also a, the, a war of the richest against the poor that uh, enters now a new phase, a phase that is established within this wave of power with a long wave of violence against people that are um, forced to displace themselves, to dislodge themselves. And the pedagogy of domination, the values that the elites use to dominate uh, the poor, the hegemony of crunch puts us in uh, complex situations of the value of domination, the patriarchal family, the uh, extreme poverty, that there is not enough for everyone, the idea that we must defend ourselves from migrant people. They are terrorists, they steal uh, from us. The, and these are the ideas of the extreme uh, right that um, disseminate this idea. This, but the declaration of a human right is being replaced by the declaration of the corporate power. So the trade of lives wins at this moment. Everything can be sold, everything can be uh, bought. Everything is under the law of offer and demand, exploitation, private property as a central volume, an inequality that is part of the normative hierarchy, institutionalized racism, applying strongly to migration wars with neocolonialism, that uh, gender division of labor uh, adjusted by the juridical ordinance. So we have the second idea of the mechanisms used by the elite in this the evaluation of a democracy. And the third idea that I want to refer to is, uh, this is a snapshot that Barbara described well, the snapshot of the horrors, million and million of people that are um, displaced, uh, traveling around the, wor the world and the dramatic snapshot in which the a pain is something that we cannot forget. Unfortunately, I don't have much time left and it, this is an academic um, event, but I want to describe the pain of all of these people that cannot count on justice. They are dying in the middle of deserts, in the oceans, um, on the borders. This is a necro, this are ne is a necropolitics. They are, allowing, they are letting these people to die, this fragmenting their rights. There are specific treatments for a certain groups. There are walls, there are borders, mass deportations, criminalization of solidarity, concentration camps, the hardships of uh, colonial uh, procedures, a division of society between people that can be assimilated and people that will be um, exterminated. So we, it leads us to reaffirm how human rights were set aside, um, where we uh, prioritize uh, corporate practices. They, human rights are being emptied by uh, processes of uh, enriching um, the riches. And uh, I'd like to refer to the four idea, the complete re reconfiguration of human rights, especially those who are forced to migrate. So we see this reconfiguration that is something that can be established in three different categories. First, the precariousness, not only precarious labor relations, but also precarious rights. This is part of the core 
of the establishment of different relationships. If we see labor relationships in, uh, for example, the Spanish uh, law, which is extreme racist, that establish as a priority uh, jobs for uh, domestic citizens and putting migrants in a juridical limbus. So these people become object of exploitation for the dominant classes in the countries that receive them. This is a hard reality, but it exists through regulation. Is, uh, the lack of regulation is a trend around all the planet. So we see a lot of um, indigenous communities being uh, expelled from their own lands, workers that are expelled from uh, their labor environments because capitalism, metabolism need natural resources and the military industry, the oil industry, mining, the agribusiness, the tourism business, they go to these places and they have to expel these people creating this um, displacement. This, this is connected to a slave work where it, in creating a historical moment for millions of people. When people, for example, in the African continent were removed from their territory and became part of the uh, capitalism system. And we, in terms of necropolitics, we don't, and we can use different words for it, necro borders, necro capitalism, necro, the uh, politics death is entering the constitution of the system. And this is the idea of those who do not produce or do not consume, they are good for nothing. So they become a uh, human waste. These people is left to die. And this is central to this new configuration. After the Second World War, uh, we see that human rights are being destroyed. People need their rights, to have their rights established. They, these people, they become uh, infrahuman. This reminds us of other historical movements that must be considered. And we are now in this point of reconfiguration. Many people that are forced to leave their territories so that capitalism can continue to work. They're exposed to necropolities. Some are left to die. Others can reach other landers and are forced to live in uh, refugee camps or concentration camps. Others that can enter new countries are then exploited in uh, illegal and forced ways, submitted to um, juridical void. So I want to say that we are now in a moment where we have a new, new migrants that uh, travel globally with fragmented identities, fragmented and different uh, identities, and they need protection for their rights. These people need uh, an expanded juridical protection. So both in Geneva protection that must be uh, complied with and respected, it's at least in the European community, the uh, Geneva protocol is not respected. And also the convention for migrants that must be ratified, the neoliberal theory that the person migrates to work voluntarily is false. The persecution Uh, the persecution uh, of these people should be banned. We, knew, uh, we need a new juridical framework that uh, protects these people and transition. So um, we must reinterpret the reading of these rights and uh, build a new juridical network that works from uh, bottom up. It's intolerable that these people are subject to a juridical void because the interests of domination do not correspond to the majority of people. So it's essential to recover the essential uh, sense of these human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. You are uh, very inspiring. It's the second time that I have the opportunity to hear you.
And I feel very honored to be able to hear your words. And now we are going to have our second speaker, Professor André Cavalho Ramos. Professor André is a professor in the School of Law of the University of Sao Paulo and full professor in the graduate studies in the Autonomous School of Law of University of Sao Paulo. He's a doctor in international law from the School of Law of University of Sao Paulo and was visiting fellow in the International Law School in Cambridge. He is a regional attorney, national coordinator of the Working Group in Migration and Refugee. So we pass the floor to uh, Professor André de Carvalho Ramos. Thank you, Barbara. I want to greet all of the colleagues in this virtual panel. I want to thank uh, Manu, Professor Manuela, Ilan, and Professor Sandra Suarez for the invitation. I always say that uh, being invited by them is um, an honor for me. I always, um, I'm always delighted to work with them. My speech is to analyze the discrepancies between the speech and the practice that characterize the current economic globalization process led by transnational companies and its implications to international migrations, specifically focused on Brazil in the recent context of economic crisis in recent years and in the era of a pandemic, of the COVID-19 pandemic. The main matrix of globalization is eco the economy and was imposed by the practices and values of neoliberalism. The same globalization uh, affecting global mobility, goods and services is reductionist and protectionism in terms of a human mobility. Estimated data show that globalization from the point of view of the so-called inter human international mobility is completely disproportional in terms of the globalization of goods and services. The proportion of migrants in comparison to the total global population was 2.5% in 1960. Currently, it's around 3.5, 3.8%, depending on the source of data. Differently, the globalization of goods, services, and capitals is intense generation and interdependency of the economies. Therefore, there are asymmetries in globalization. I bring a study from uh, CEPAL, which is important. It's a new one agency direct uh, focus on Latin America showing discrepancies between the speech and the practices of developed country. It's not by chance that today one of the main lines of research that involves the so-called grammar of human rights is the line of um, equity. Piketty and Vici and other authors try to bring empirical data showing the absurd growth of inequality, not only between states, but also in terms of the social dimension with a very severe situation of income concentration and the concentration of plutocracy, of global put plutocracies. So bringing this about discussion, at least seven negative consequences identified due to this globalization uh, meant for a minority, the discrepancy between speech and practice on the part of um, developed countries that speak of um, economic opening of borders, but uh, at the same time promoting protectionism practices. And of course, um, enjoying the differential development, the power, power of bargaining uh, between developed and undeveloped states. The opening of the economies was one of the unmet promises since uh, development was not promoted and inequalities only grew 
as we can see in different countries. The issue involving the uh, foreign debt, which is a long-term issue involving including Brazil, the whole generation that is caused the last, the last decade is still a major problem for different countries as we see, for example, in neighboring countries, in the countries uh, surrounding Brazil. The high concentration of technology progress uh, remains the difference between the value-added goods produced with technology and those who are uh, to come from the agribusiness also remains generating macroeconomic vulnerability for different countries that do not um, possess a diversified arsenal of technologies in their economies. Talking about migrations in the context of COVID-19 and the closing of borders, this has um, fueled uh, xenophobic movements uh, that keep the migrants as excluded elements of society, leaving aside any promise to create plurality, inclusion, and respect for the rights of everyone. We must say that the Convention of the UN, the so-called nine ma major conventions, where we, the one that has the lowest number of ratifications, the only treaty, the only convention of, of human rights that Brazil has not ratified among the nine major treaties promoted by the UN is the International Convention of a migrant uh, workers' rights and their families. So this is the symbol of the failure of this vision, specifically after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the utopic uh, vision of the positive consequences of the globalization. This is the symbol failure of this theory, creating what Ottaviani calls this topic globalization. Hence, this feeling of frustration of the so-called uh, global, globalization excluded elements, as we see through the Brexit and different movements where we have the denial of the democratic system, what Justice Barroso calls abusive uh, constitutionalism and authoritarian legalism. Therefore, all contemporary studies on the liberal democracies and the risk brought by this frustration generated by intense exclusion and concentration of income. As this globalization is strongly concentrationalism and strongly reductionism, reductionist, the reality today is much closer to what Milanovic states that should not surprise us. This wave of uh, globalization reinforces ties of subordination, exclusion, and violation of rights. So how should we deal with migration in this context of reductionist globalization, strongly focused on income concentration and increased um, exclusion. In the Latin American context and in terms of Brazil, interregional migration has been growing and intra-regional uh, migration has been increasing as well as we can see in this irregular flow of um, people from Venezuela to Brazil and previously in the flow of uh, people in vulnerability situations from Haiti. So Brazil is challenged to form a clear political position on migrations, taking into consideration the Brazilian national commitment to its own constitution, to the migration laws, and international commitment to the international human rights treaties and the Convention 19, of 1951 of the Statute of Refugees which is turning 70. So in this moment of economic crisis, of pandemic, we can say that we have learned how not to do things. I gave a talk in uh, Passo Fundo recently, 
and the lecture was what have we learned from the pandemic we have learned that it is necessary in these contexts of crisis is necessary to reinforce the protection of rights the rights to inclusion because vulnerability no vulnerability is enhanced and in the case of migrations uh, brazil did the opposite shut off its borders uh, um, disregarded uh, the historic principle of not um, of not uh, refusing entry to refugees. Um, the situation with the Venezuelans is uh, has completely uh, changed now. Um, we're expecting a decision about the border change from CONADI, the Council on um, Migrations, and this is um, a position that should never have been abandoned, which is the humanitarian entry. So we should turn our eyes to the preservation of rights. The logic of the migration law is inclusive, that it's not perfect. There was no agency the specialists committee that I was a member of had suggested this to have a public policy specialized in migration that at least in the absence of the agency we can also conclude that we have advanced so this memory of the um, the migration uh, question has to be uh, preserved for future crises so that there's a tendency to use human m m movements in the context of hyper exploitation. It's not undocumented workers that generates hyper exploitation. It's hyper exploitation is what stimulates undocumented migration. So we have to deal with uh, migration in terms of inclusion and preservation of rights, because with that, we can establish a framework or a normative framework that can uh, bring us closer to the ideal, which is the ideal of protection and what the constitution and treaties seek to achieve. Inevitably, hyper-exploitation generates asymmetries, internal asymmetries, tensions, this disbelief in democracy, has been happening in various parts in the world, including in Brazil. So in conclusion, I think I've already gone over my time. As Rosana Hayes, my my friend, Professor Rosana Hayes, um, human societies move, regardless of this idea, these xenophobic uh, positions about building walls, uh, societies move and human rights should accompany societies on the move, especially in the economic, political, social and environmental dimensions. So when we talk about this migratory phenomenon, we must understand what is behind. And what is behind this is that fighting hyper exploitation using the grammar of human rights as a resource, we can elim eliminate this vicious cycle where uh, migrations are a fuel to the growth of uh, concentration, the creation of fortresses with xenophobic movements, which of course re uh, redound in even more uh, exclusion and more global plutocrats. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Barbara, back to you. We are the ones who are grateful, Professor. It's very, uh, it's great to hear you. It's my second time, so it's always great. Thank you for your talk. Um, remember, everyone, if you have questions or comments, uh, use the Q&A function. 
and at the end we'll open up for debate and you can ask a question orally if you so choose so we're very pleased to invite our third guest uh, Ruth Marie Nicolas. She's the spokesperson of the Toledo Solidarity Embassy, and she is a language teacher, Portuguese and English. So, welcome, Ruth. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I want to greet all the speakers i'm very much honored to receive this opportunity to take part in this conversation i was uh, listening carefully i think i was able to absorb a lot i want to humbly uh, because we we have this embassy and we service uh, uh, our um, immigrants who come to us. We, I'm very young, I'm still learning a lot. This Solidarity Embassy was created because of a need here in the city of Toledo, in the west of Paraná, and there are 15 nationalities, 8,000 migrants by the Solidarity Embassy. This is in south of Brazil. I'd like to talk about the question of immigrants as uh, an experience. I'm Haitian. I've been in Brazil for nine years. So when I talk about migration, to me, it's uh, a life experience. I, it's quite emotional for me because it's my reality is what i face and we deal with people here that are going through the same situations so i'd like to share with you um, things that you probably know it's no not a novelty but it's what i have here to to share with you we know that immigrants um, have many reasons to migrate, educational, environmental, social, economic, but what we have suffered here is the invisibility of the immigrant. We like to talk uh, generally, but I'd like to talk about immigrant women because this is what we have uh, most uh, faced. We have here immigrant women who sometimes depends on the partner to survive because she doesn't have access to the health system, because there is uh, the language barrier. This is something we are working with very, with much love to help women to have independence and freedom to be able to do her things, to seek a job. And it's a small step because the task is huge, but there are not many of us. We're quite thinly spread. One of the hospitals here called Bon Jesus uh, or the public health system asked, call us to, to translate. So we're very happy to help. But at the same time, it's sad because the public system should have a support system to, to be able to um, translate for people. But in the end, they resort to us be able to translate um, medical consultations. This is very sad because people suffer unnecessarily. They leave their countries with the idea that they'll have a, a better uh, life, uh, they'll be supported. I don't think that's only about Brazil. With the pandemic, we have a situation of migratory crisis when arriving, for example, here in Brazil, the reality is completely different. Migrants uh, are looked as looked upon as people who are taking over jobs, who are taking over space. 
to somebody who is uncomfortable, is inconvenient. It's not true, of course. We know that Brazil uh, exports more people than imports. We have 1.8 million immigrants in Brazil and, and 3 million Brazilians living abroad. And 1.8 million is less than 1% of the uh, Brazilian population. These people do not feel supported, embraced when they arrive in Brazil. People leave their countries sometimes because of hunger or war. We have the situation of Haiti, which is living a chaotic moment. A lot of people are leaving the country for various reasons but country is living through a political crisis, a civil uh, crisis. Brazil uh, is a welcoming country, but the public bodies are not doing their homework because people do not have information, they don't have the support they need because um, immigrants who come to us, they want us to how shall I say, just to give them information because there's no um, policy basically for immigrants. So people, immigrants don't know how to access the public health system, for instance. And if they do, then how is the access done? They don't know the rights, they sit in their corner. They don't know the rights they have here, where to resort to, who to resort to. It's very sad, we say that here, the question of violence, because owing to the invisibility, especially of the immigrant woman, um, there is a situation of violence against immigrant women, and that has been growing. It's sad when we talk about women become statistics because of the violence they undergo. At least here, in my side of the city, in Western Paraná, we don't enter the statistics because there's no record of the immigrant women. So we ask for help. I would like to have this and that. Uh, and the question... So often, the reply we get from the authorities is, can you prove that these people are living here? So sadder than becoming a statistic is to not become a statistic. This is quite an emotional issue, issue for me. It's very hard to do the work without support, especially the women who don't have the support they need. This is a sad uh, fact. So I have here a letter to the world that was written by the president of the Solidarity Embassy, Edna Nunes, a journalist. She founded the embassy five years ago. So we created this letter to the world, to people all over the world to sensitize them and to talk about the reality we are living through. This material will be shared with you on the platform for anyone who is curious and have access later on. So in this letter to the world, we start saying, have you ever wished to change the world? Did you wake up one day and wanted and or needed to change the world to make the world a better place for all, not just for you and your family, but for everyone around you? make the world a better place and so we're also going to work on how the embassy was created it's a very exciting story inspiring story it's a long story but so edna saw the need uh, and made who is one of the volunteers that helps us uh, put together the idea of the embassy. And we have faced many struggles, 
regarding you know migrants uh, need uh, to learn the language uh, to be able to find a job we work on that we do our jobs we we know that the private sector exploits this workforce the immigrants are often young people with qualifications but because they don't uh, because of the language barrier they end up going to um, jobs um, in meatpacking for instance which is the easiest uh, the, the, the the easiest jobs to get so these workers are very much exploited by the private sector by the corporations so there's the violence there's the invisibility and thank god lately uh, there there is a growth in entrepreneurship among immigrants so we have workshops to encourage uh, immigrants to um, open their own businesses and to realize their dreams so we have a very beautiful example of Abidou, who is from Senegal, very talented man. He started making clothes with um, textiles from West Africa, and it was very well received. So the region absorbed very well this um, culture. The clothes are very beautiful. So we're now seeing Brazilians with the Senegalese clothing in the street. In the day-to-day uh, -day lives, we see Brazilian women with turban. I'm a Haitian, so I don't have that uh, habit, but um, Abdul's uh, clothes and turbans have gone down very well. With the demand, he has a store he has the production but with the pandemic um, he's no longer uh, here but there's a lot of many stories to tell but with the pandemic there was a drop because we know that the reality is very different from what people say many haitians tried to go to the United States and leave Brazil behind. And this and here in our region, there was a need for, there's a labor shortage. And so they're valuing uh, us a little bit more. I'm not going to mention the name of any corporations here, but there's one company that started investing they realized that they were losing their workers the foreign workers were uh, leaving brazil so they started investing in training portuguese language classes to help the immigrants want to uh, be qualified quicker to be able to meet the labor uh, demands so we work as as little ants because one day at a time, one step at a time, that's how we advance. I think the 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 talks have been very uh, significant, very deep, and I humbly offer you my experience here in the west of Paraná in the south of Brazil. Thank you, Ruth. We're very grateful for your words, uh, very strong uh, um, words relating your experience, reporting your experience. Uh, you touched me very deeply. I think this idea of bringing together academia with uh, lived experiences is very important. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. So in this spirit, we invite our next speaker, who is uh, 
Wilson Senatus. He is an engineering student in the Federal University of Paraná and and the executive director of the Professional and Students Haitian Association from Paraná. Um, thank you for joining us, Wilsert. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. I have learned a lot from everyone's uh, talks. And I've been in Brazil since 2015. In 2015, I uh, graduated in the logistics course. In 2017, I entered the university through the Primubi. Uh, program. It's a, a program for migrants in Brazilian universities. When I joined the university, since 2015, I was trying to enter the university as a migrant, but I did not know if I would have access to uh, university programs. When I dis then I discovered that there was this policy created by um, international law professors that have a struggle, that have fought to create this program, to open access to migrant students, to higher education. When I joined in 2017, I saw the number of uh, migrants that were in the university and that this was a very low number. So this program had started in 2014 and we created an association to try to boost this number of uh, migrants that were studying in university to open access uh, to more people in our community. So from 2017 to 2018, we were able to motivate like a tall group of migrants, showing them that with an additional effort, they could join the university to improve their, their educational profile. So we created a partnership with the Department of International Law, uh, and also a partnership with the Department of Humanities. We, we also created um, classes for Haitian language, Haitian history. We established a partnership also with the incubator inside the university uh, to promote graduate studies for the migrant community inside the university, focus on a solidar economy. So we try to, we establish those partnerships because uh, this is an element that will create big changes in our community in, in the integration with the Brazilian society. It's a form of integration. So still in this uh, topic, as migrants who live in Brazil, sometimes we don't know which path we should follow. Sometimes we need, we need when we need things and we go to institutions, they sometimes, oh, we, we are, um, denied the information that we need. Uh, sometimes uh, health professionals, for example, that work for the public health system, uh, as they see that we are migrants, when they see that we are migrants, they treat us differently. So speaking of migration, the migrations in Brazil until 2017, Well, I, I, I had access to a report saying that in 2010, there, was, uh, not even, there were not even 20 Haitians in Brazil. After 2014 and the earthquake, we 
a high number of migrants from uh, Haiti were received in Brazil. It's a new term for UN, we are what we call environmental refugees. So Haitians, uh, it is as we are included in this group. These are people that were forced to leave their um, home home cities due to natural disasters, vol vol volcanoes and eruptions um, other natural disasters. So the distribution of these migrations in Brazil until 2017, 73% uh, of the refugees in Brazil, 73% would then were due to um, environmental disasters. When we talk about migration, it's not only a matter of migration, but also not only people that leave their countries to live in other countries, but also people that are displaced in uh, inside Brazil as well. So the 73% of migrants due to environmental um, causes, including Haitians, we have a little bit more than 1 million people that uh, migrate due to violence as well. This is what has been happening recently in Haiti. And also more than 1 million people that uh, had to migrate due to lack of uh, due to lack of development people that are looking for better um, livelihoods better better living conditions so the human rights that are uh, declared by international the treaties such as the uh, declaration of human rights and civil pacts of uh, political rights and uh, in, my, in migration, we, we have the concept of a refuge. The person leaves from their hometown, sometimes due to natural uh, disasters. or due to um, conflicts, for example. This is what we call economic refuge. Me, as one of the persons responsible for the association, we work with these migrants. We see their situations in the labor market, for example, or in society. When we talk about companies, for example, uh, the issue of housing, if a migrant wants to rent a house, for example, companies know that they will treat migrants in a different way. Sometimes they don't have documents. So the contract that is signed with the migrant is different in the uh, workplace as well. The treatment given to migrants is different. The contracts are different. Economic rights as well, regardless of the size of um, the company. So universities, for example, should offer their services respecting the rights of all uh, companies. Um, should, uh, should treat all of their empl employees with respect. There are social cultural um, gains with these integrations. In Brazil, uh, companies usually does not respect workers' basic rights and migrants suffer even more with this kind of practice because first they do not speak the language, they don't have uh, papers, usually they don't have all due documentation Sometimes migrants are forced us to work without a proper uh, compensation and without a right to um, uh, rest leaves or... So we see uh, 
cases of migrants working under irregular uh, conditions. There are companies that have the preference to employ migrants because they can manipulate these people. Sometimes these people are forced to leave their homes here in Brazil to, to work in other places inside Brazil as well. There is an example, a company called me saying that they need a number of different migrants to work in other cities. Sometimes they don't respect even the basic uh, requirements of a proper employment. In terms of businesses and um, human rights, the companies, they have they can impact individuals. The public power should uh, regulate the, the corporation so they that they respected people's rights, be them nationals or Brazilians, Brazilian national citizens or migrants. Human rights belong to all and to each one of us. So for example, the Brazilian criminal code, article 149, that uh, bans forced work or, or work uh, similar to slavery. I have seen uh, migrants having to sign just cause termination um, notices without any, uh, any reason, without any justification. And the interest of the employer was just not to pay severance pay. So companies should support and respect the protection of internationally recognized human rights. Brazil is a signatory of international treaties. Bra companies should support diversity in companies. Um, they should uh, respect the right to collective uh, bargaining, but they want to hire migrate grades without considering the elimination, for example, of all forms of forced labor. In 2018, the presidential decree number 9571 was approved on November 21, 1995, creating the national guidelines for human rights in companies. This decree is based by on the guiding principles published by the UN, dealing with the corporate responsibilities in terms of respect to human rights. And in Article 7, says provides that companies should um, guarantee uh, respect to human rights, the proper compensation, and but globally speaking, sometimes corporations grow more than the power of states. They use uh, migrant work uh, in an irregular way. Um, the contracts with um, migrants do not um, comply with uh, corporate law. So we must uh, build up on the guarantee to human rights, promotion of decent work, do uh, proper uh, corporate practices, public policies, and government actions with the goal of valuing diversity, regardless of social, uh, um, ethnic uh, origin, to fight against a disguised slave work, giving the same opportunities to all. So I want to thank you once again for the opportunity. We thank you very much. I'm sorry, can you hear me? I have a problem with my microphone. Yes, we can hear you. So, Wilzert, uh, we thank you for your words. We thank you also for um, uh, hearing about your experience, this is something very enriching for our panel. And now I want to invite our next speaker, 
who is Jose Luis Gutierrez Aranda. Since 2012, he's responsible for uh, policies related to natural resources and trade in Africa Eurofaith um, Network in Brussels. Previously, he was responsible for uh, live volunteer work promoting interculturalism and integration of migrants in Spain. He has worked as a um, migration attorney for one decade, has research on the right of reunif family reunification of undocumented migrants in the European Union. Currently, he's a member of the global campaign to disassemble the corporate power and uh, do away with impunity. Giselle Lee is a master in law from uh, University of Sevilla in uh, Spain and a moral theology in the University of Leuven, Belgium. Also a Bachelor of Philosophy from University of Comillas in Spain. So it's an honor and a pleasure that we invite our last speaker, uh, Professor Aranda, and then we'll start the Q&A session. Welcome, Professor. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you also, Homan, for giving me the opportunity to speak of this reality of forced migrations from the point, from a little bit different uh, uh, position that we uh, heard in the previous uh, talks, but uh, more focused on the African continent. So usually we don't hear about the drama and uh, through caravans of migrants uh, this, this going nowhere and uh, refugee camps. Sometimes the media forget that forced migrations are originated in the desks of in the offices of people that are responsible for financial policies, economic policies in developed country. We want to talk about migration to, um, originated in Africa, ending up in the expel, expulsion of millions of people from their home communities, trying to challenge the causes of migrations of millions of, pay, of uh, people we first have to analyze the free trade agreement between Africa and Europe. And for some years, we also tried to analyze the behavior of um, large European corporations in Africa. To that, I want to start my speech with a very significant data. This data can show us why Africa has become the object of desire for richer companies. With that, they are forcing millions of people to migrate from their hometowns. Well, in the first place, I start by this very general data. The African continent has one third of mineral reserves of the planet. Under the ground in Africa, more than 40% of the gold reserves are hidden. 55% of diamond reserves, 65% of cobalt, uh, reserves and around 80% of platinum reserves. If we talk about arable lands, fertile lands, these numbers skyrocket. According to Fidelity, only 10% of the 400 million hectares of cultivated uh, of uh, arable lands are planted today. Be mm commercial terms, Africa generates 700 tons of products per year and has at least half of the arable land in the planet. In terms of uh, population, we have a young continent with more than 1 billion, 200 million people. And according to some estimates, in 2050, this will be almost 2 billion people, half of which will have less than 25 years of age. This makes Africa a continent with a huge consumption potential allowing the expansion to all the other major economies in the world. Given these uh, figures, we have the capitalistic uh, thinking that immediately tries 
to establish um, investments so that they uh, in considering to perpetuate the poverty of course without considering the rights of uh, local communities indigenous peoples and when capitalist logics come in the goal is to do away with family agriculture subsistence agriculture which accounts for 85 percent of the properties in africa creating infrastructure such as bridges uh, highways airports as if this thinkers had forgotten that in these territories they have people families languages and cultures still living these people deserve to live with dignity in terms of the concept of forced migration the international organization for migrations identified forced migrations as the my migratory movement produced by a number of involuntary circumstances such as case from persecution conflict repression or natural disasters be them provoked by men by the environmental degradation or other situations that put these people's existence in danger <laughs> We have three categories of forced migrations, those that are caused by conflicts, by economic development, and the ones caused by natural disasters. I'm going to focus on the second type, forced migrations caused by uh, economic development, making these realities uh, produced by deterioration by large companies. not just responsibility from the investing countries but there's major responsibility on the part of the countries where the violations of the human rights take part forced migrations caused by corporations or mega projects lead us to think naively that they are produced in favor of economic development creation of mega dams or highways or airports but forced migrations caused by corporations are not because of mega projects but in many cases they are produced because of extractive industries oil or minerals or agricultural corporations that take over uh, the living space of a certain population. So, the, so people are compelled to move, to leave their homes. These are used that are prolonged over time and end up deteriorating the living conditions of the population. The flight is often the result of the, f of the, uh, is, is, is because people resist and often it's because of the destruction of the survival infrastructure economic infrastructure so so these forced displacements um, in the how, how is that compatible with the promise of the investments to improve lives so i want to present some of the economic dynamics uh, political, environmental, that bring about these forced migrations in Africa. Africa is crisscrossed by a multitude of uh, multilateral agreements. These international agreements establish themselves at regional, continental, and intercontinental level. These cooperation agreements lay the foundations for the economic agreements and so the main factor favoring the arrival of corporations in Africa and the construction of infrastructures derived from these international political agreements, which facilitate foreign direct investment, both for corporations, as well as the possibility to operate without accountability with fiscal uh, tax breaks and other facilities and impunity when it comes to immunity when it comes to executing these projects so 
the most uh, relevant agreements are between are within uh, southern, central, and western Africa. These political agreements uh, are the underpinning for sectoral and economic uh, agreements, including the customs unions and even monetary policy. So now there is a negotiation of a Africa-wide free trade agreement. It's a trade agreement between 44 countries of the European of the African Union, and it would be the biggest free trade zone in the world, a single market that would permit the free circulation of people and also a monetary union. This treaty reproduces all the main inconvenience for the population and for development as do the the agreements with the developed countries. For example, the reduction of tariffs, which would favor the more industrialized African countries over the rest, and lead to the worsening of public policies and open the door to privatization of public corporations. So there, one must highlight the Cotonou Agreement between the European Union and the African Union, which over the last decade has facilitated the establishment of major uh, European corporations on the continent, which has led in many cases to forced migrations. This political agreement is based on three pillars, uh, strengthening of democratic uh, projects and economic, trade, and development cooperation. The pillars, pillars one and two are excuses to get to the true interests of the European Union, which are the commercial and economic treaties which facilitate for European corporations the access to the raw materials the, and the consumption markets without having to pay any form of tariff. This practice condemns um, African states to um, pauperization and deteriorates public services and forces uh, indigenous uh, industries uh, to um, lower their standards. There are many other bilateral agreements that have a single purpose, which is the economic purpose, like United States, China, Japan, or Canada. All these bilateral trade agreements uh, hark back to the 80s when the World Bank imposed on Africa the structural adjustment plan that demanded a series of infrastructures that could guarantee the uh, fluidity of the loans granted. These millions of dislocated people, displaced people by development has continued. People are experiencing extreme poverty. Very often, migration is the only way out. So we must talk about also land grants, which is the last stage of this uh, absurd uh, practices. Because of the increase in um, raw material prices to avoid to avoid uh, shortages in the rich countries, um, the increase uh, in land grabs have to do with speculative purposes and also with biofuels. So the environmental and social consequences of the land grabs has brought about the lack of uh, fertile lands for small uh, peasant farmers, and also the end of many common lands, common properties, in favor of monoculture plantations. So in 2006, there was created by the FAO, the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa. So it was 
created by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates. Agra says that they support sustainable development, uh, nutrition, poverty reduction, adaptation, and mitigation to climate change. Good words, but failed to achieve any of the objectives. So all these projects were funded by billions of dollars through international organism uh, bodies like the World Bank. This institution, AGRA, do not pay attention to how these loans are affecting small farmers. So they do not monitor the impacts of their loans. They just are concerned about farmers acquiring seeds and agrochemicals and fertilizers and other inputs from the private sector. So imagine this. Imagine a small group of peasant farmers who uh, borrow money to invest in GM seeds that must be accompanied by chemical inputs that make people abandon their traditional uh, crops. So these uh, practices have been ruinous. So AGRA has done its best to influence governments in Africa in favor of government, in favor of corporations uh, for fertilizers, agrochemicals and seeds. So when farmers face difficulties in paying back their loans, um, they have to abandon agriculture. Often these seeds are completely incompatible with their traditional farming practices. And that's when the, corporate, the agricultural corporations arrive and take over the land. So firstly, in conclusion, I want to say that these realities that I've described leak are all about the race for Africa's natural uh, wealth. So why are corporations from all over the world wanting to position themselves in Africa? Not just raw material companies, energy, technological companies, extractive or agricultural, the major corporations, transnational corporations, for decades have been setting up shop in Africa, are completely con continuing the plunder of Africa while the population continues to suffer. It's a new colonialism, but now sponsored by corporations. It is not done by the states. It's conducted by corporations, grounded on trade agreements. He has muted himself by mistake. You've muted yourself by mistake, Jose Luis. Oh, here we go. So it's only the last uh, 20 seconds. So I just want to conclude. So this re these realities that I've described are about the race for Africa's resources. Second place, we are facing a new colonialism, which is no longer sponsored by states, by countries, but rather by transnational corporations from the same countries. The circumstances lead us to to have new waves of forced migrations. The arrival of COVID, although we don't have very good uh, figures, they this has put the brakes on, to a certain extent, on migration. So 
So it's the first time in 25 years that the African economic growth has uh, dropped. This is probably going to be temporary, but this has um, led 40 million Africans to join the ranks of the extremely poor. So the problems of economic policy coherence um, have to do with the international political and economic treaties, which are the framework for these policies. So unless there is a good governance and, and a fight against corruption in the countries where there are human rights violations and we continue to have the impunity of major corporations, the situation will only worsen. So these forced and desperate migrations will continue to exist. The number of immigrants keeps growing. No human being should be forced to uh, seek refuge in other in another country, and certainly no one no one does this out of uh, a spite. So, migrations of these people um, um, presume that countries are being drained of qualified personnel. So we can account those that emigrate specifically because of infrastructural works, but all of those that leave their communities because of a deterioration um, of living conditions. So what are the political mechanisms that could control the uh, that could control the transnational corporations, they are so far insufficient to protect, um, like the OECD guidelines and the, the and other instruments are continued to be volu voluntary regulations. And so forced migrations continue. So there is a need for extraterritorial international law to be able to um, prosecute the human rights violations by corporations. So I consider it urgent to protect the human rights defenders. So very often persecution is what leads to immigration. Those that stand up for their rights face persecution. Persecution, forgive me. So there is a need to recognize the community's rights as such and their participation in the decision making about major projects on their territories. We cannot forget the voices of the legitimate owners of the land. They have the right to say no um, to this supposed development that despoils their land. And in any case, there should be fair compensation for people to have a dignified existence if they have been forced to migrate. Thank you very much for your attention, and I am at your disposal for the debate. Okay, we are the ones that thank you. Thank you very much, Jose Luis, for your forceful uh, words. Thank you very much for uh, our debate. Um, we do have some time still for the debate. So firstly, I want to say thank you once again to all our guests. So I want to raise a few points to debate. Some, some questions are aimed at a particular speaker. Others are more general, so feel free to comment if just if just make you tailor your comments to uh, whichever questions uh, you find most relevant or most interesting to you so we have here a question for Ruth so it's a direct question if the solidarity uh, embassy accepts donations 
I don't see. So if you want to put the banking information uh, on the chat, how people can make the donation, that would be uh, much appreciated. We accept all kinds of donations. In the last page of the booklet, uh, there's our Instagram, our Facebook pages where uh, it says where you can donate. Thank you. So we have general questions and then um, we go more to, to the more specific ones. There's one to Juan Fernandez Machado. With the increase in xenophobia in countries with a history of uh, uh, migration, the optimistic views that xenophobia tends to decrease with the contact between immigrants and uh, the, ho the, the host country population. Is that still valid that with integration, the xenophobia will decrease? And the second question, another general question, and then people can uh, um, reply as they wish from Professor Manuela. So I'd like to know if after the approval of the new law of immigration in 2017, is there the perception of any objective change in the treatment of immigrants by the institutions of the state or maybe has the political moment we're experiencing, did that um, affect negatively the implementation of the 2017 immigration law? And then we'll go to the replies. Well, I can start. Can you hear me? Yes. I, please feel free to answer. Well, I'm going to focus more on the second question from Professor Manuela about uh, the uh, new situation that we're living. Professor Manuela has already addressed the exceptional circumstances that we have seen in these last two years. So the migration law was adopted in a moment when we had a change in the uh, context of the Brazilian administration, but in a rare moment that we were living in Brazil of multi uh, a multi-partisan moment. But the law uh, that was obtained in this, this multi-partisan context did not complete the transformation cycle that was imagined for the treatment of migrations in Brazil. So there were advancements, of course, in the statute of migrants, but the part that from my point of view was indispensable, the reformulation of uh, public policies was not addressed by uh, this law. There's a generic provision for the need of coordination, specifically due to the fragmentation of the this treatment, both at the munici municipal, state, and national level. Uh, although this is a typically a federal um, topic, the federal government should lead this process. The national agency was not created. So we have an administrative situation that is still fragmented and we will st still need further development. Uh, what we already know in the area of uh, human rights, uh, the evolution of standards without the evolution of institutions may frustrate the, the ultimate goals of the initiative. So we still have different ministries dealing with the situation. We still we have the National Council of Migration, we have an important administrative role of the federal police in Brazil. 
I reinforced that the draft in the ex experts um, committee had eliminated the actions of the federal police from in the area of migration. So the federal police can also dedicate their um, efforts as the judiciary police for the, for the federal government. So we still have the fragmentation, the so-called patch policy. So whenever we have a crisis, there is some form of action. As we seen in the case of Afghans and other crises that we had from the, as migrants from Venezuela, so I'd see that the um, advancers uh, that we have seen still deserve institutional uh, monitoring. But this uh, normative uh, advancements were perceived by the judiciary branch. The next uh, topic of a discussion on migrations is this um, strategic litigation on migrations of how will we use the judiciary power to um, as uh, an indispensable support. So, uh, recently in the Brazilian courts, there was a resolution in September 2021 encouraging uh, judges to take uh, treaties in consideration to adopt decisions whose initial fundament are the treaties, putting into check the decrease of closing of borders. So in this sense, this um, decision has um, been encouraging more judiciary decision than institutional, institutionalized framework as we have imagined previously. Thank you, Professor Andre. Does any of the speakers wish also to speak on the first question? the increase of the optimistic view in which uh, xenophobia tends to decrease or um, and I take the opportunity to also add another question because one question ends up adding to each other and we can have a um, broader debate. This question directed to Jose Luis from Andresa. How's did the dynamic of COVID has changed the situation of migrants in Europe? And this question may lead to other uh, elements as well. So I asked this question. And uh, from Professor Manuela Holland, I want to ask Juan Subizaret and Juan Luis if the topic of migrations is included in the international agenda of human rights and businesses, if it's treated in national action plans and legislation in due diligences. And what is your opinion on that? Thank you for the questions. In the theme of uh, xenophobia, I am not optimistic, for sure. Xenophobia continues to increase, and I think that the, there is a trend to have even uh, more uh, xenophobia. I think that um, on the theme of poverty, I think that uh, we have a lot of prejudice against poor migrations. The po this poverty that is associated to uh, migrations, it, it's, and also we have a racism. So we have prejudice against poverty, racism, and also xenophobia. In terms of what happens in Africa, 
we have a more specific vision, different, different than what we have in Europe. We don't have data about the situation of COVID in Africa. It's a mystery. There is no reliable data. Certainly, the pandemia the is the pandemic is also in Africa. It's leading to uh, deaths, to uh, uh, collateral effects in the population, but we don't have data as we have in Europe. This um, also is a reason of concern to us because we cannot act. Likewise, in the topic of vaccines. So are there mechanisms to make the uh, to pro promote vaccination in Africa as we are having in developed uh, countries? Are the vaccines enough? So there is a resistance in, the, uh, in terms of vaccination in Africa. And also, how uh, corporations have been behaving in Africa during the period of um, social isolation in the world. In uh, major corporations have accelerated the exploitation of natural resources in Africa during the pandemic. They continue to exploit um, natural resources. There, were, there was less control due to the restrictions of uh, movements and traveling during the pandemic. And with that, they continue major corporations um, had even greater impunity. In the cases where we were able to monitor, we saw that companies, they were publicly uh, stating that they were being economically affected, that there was no labor force, that they had problems to allow their products to circulate. But the information that we have from our local organizations is that the economic activity uh, continued as usual. And they also, um, benefited from different opportunities. Uh, there were cases in which that they took opportunities not to renew contracts, but we don't have objective data to be able to say or to offer figures about that. But uh, certainly uh, they um, went on with their businesses during the pandemic. About the topic of uh, the international agenda, of course, that uh, the international agenda and uh, in the topic of migrations, what they do is that they are simply uh, offering data uh, of deaths of forced displacement, but there is no attempt to make to take uh, protective measures, juridical measures on the side of the European Union. In the terms, in terms of the European Union, they, uh, we are getting further and further away from uh, human rights. Uh, for example, we, the European Union support Turkey and Morocco, where there are clear violations of human rights. So the international agenda does not defend um, to force uh, migrants. This is the first. Um, this is very evident for us. When we speak of economic uh, conditions, the elites and governments do not want to incorporate forced mig migrations to um, the now liberal racist economic model, which is the model that dominates capitalism at this moment. So they don't mix international agendas. They are completely separated because accepting the unification of these agendas would be to recognize that transnational companies, as Jose Luis um, told us um, of the export contracts and the cooperation for development is a cooperation condition to the control of migrations. This is the same as recognize, recognizes that the economic model is completely unfair. It's a, a, a colonial model. This is a strong contradiction. That's why they will continue to keep these agendas apart. I'm not a specialist, but the far right, I know that what happens in terms of the rights of migrants, this is not 
dealt with in the field of um, human rights, but rather in the electoral um, field. So the far right continues to criminalize people that escape from extreme poverty. The far right criminalizes these people and they are simply against them. So this electoral uh, logic defended by the far right and also by the center right so uh, we think we need that um, workers with temporary contracts or fixed contracts or even informal workers they um, they see migrants as their enemies it's a, a war uh, among the poor and what different sectors of society are doing they are provoking, uh, instead of the defense of rights, they are allowing for an increase of the far, uh, of the far right. So we need to experience, we must create places of meeting uh, out of uh, the state. The, we need to institutionalize this effort, we that are uh, we must establish relationships among us. There's relationships that are uh, will certainly not be created by the far right administrations and governments. Thank you, thank you, everyone. We are here trying to absorb everything. There are still two questions. Maybe Andre can help us. One from Andresa. What specific points in the agenda of human rights and businesses and the regulation of transnational companies where they can influence uh, in the migration crisis? And a second question from Wilson. Um, the question is if a migrant can participate of social acts and in if the social acts are transformed into political acts will the new law guarantee the participation their participation so this would be the two questions Thank you for your question. About Andres's questions on uh, human rights and transnational companies, if they can, this can have a direct in, impact on the uh, migra mig migration crisis. From the general point of view, I believe that migrants that are included mm, that have their rights uh, attacked and where we have the there's a corporate power they will benefit from this agenda for me of course that there's a erosion of the state regulatory power we need a uh, stronger influence of in the defense of uh, human rights. Specifically undocumented migrants, because uh, migrations, uh, of course, it's a plural question. We have uh, different segments of society that uh, do not uh, face the traditional uh, problems of migrations, but we have a number of undocumented migrants that have um, uh, they're affected, uh, that have an increased vulnerability. 
And the north of my research, the guide, the main point of my research is not exactly to show that this lack of documentation um, increases vulnerability, but to to the, to cause this vulnerability, this un lack of documentation, this undocumented uh, workers are essential to create this vulnerability. So the need of documentation, which is indispensable for the rights of all included, the needs to have basic rights to look for employment, which is something that was proposed by the committee of experts. So we want there to be a migratory regular uh, regular uh, we don't want the tradition which is a amnesty every 10 years so like a band-aid solution rather than having a, a, a regular solution it's much better to uh, regularize uh, um, documentation for immigrants to avoid this need for every 10 years to have an amnesty. So we have to have policies to welcome immigrants so there's we have for example hiring policies for the disabled and other vulnerable uh, populations. So why not have similar policies for immigrant workers to avoid these hyper exploitation, the um, modern forms of slavery. There's a, a film called Seven Prisoners Brazilian film that shows the situation of undocumented workers, the modern day slavery, bringing together these facets for us to have uh, the benefits of the agenda of human rights and corporations for the immigrants. So regarding the social and political participation of immigrants, it it is there are a number of restrictions in the old law restrictions that had that were incompatible with the 1988 constitution they were eliminated by the new law of 2017 so there is no restriction uh, to take part in social and political activities there has been no advance to the point of uh, granting political rights in the strict sense, the right to vote, for example, but the right to gather, the right to information, the right to associate, um, freedom of expression, all these are uh, absolutely ensured by the treaties, by the 2017 law, by the Brazilian constitution. So what generates an, a sort of a deterrent effect an inhibition is if the person is undocumented. So, yes, that does act as a deterrent effect, not just in Brazil, of course. So, Will Zort, you have your hand up. Do you want to compliment? Do you have any doubt? We can't hear you, Wilzert. Okay. Regarding what the professor said, the new law, the 2017 law, I've met lawyers from some movements that are demanding there are Haitian 
uh, immigrants living in a squat in Curitiba. I went there to get to know the place. I was able to help a lot of immigrants to get their papers in order. But the lawyer of this movement that is in this occupation is saying that they have to go to the rallies. They, uh, we in the university, we try to talk to the professors in the law department to see if it's possible. But in our view, we imagine because if because we don't have the right to vote, it's difficult to ask an immigrant who doesn't have the right to vote to say down with the government. So if we have the right to vote, then we would feel more uh, um, at liberty to call for the downfall of the government. This is a so you can only uh, become uh, to become a voter in Brazil. You have to naturalize yourself Brazilian. So the country is practically our country Haiti is practically shut down. But they're going to to become naturalized Brazilian. You need to have um, a, 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 a um, a negative criminal, uh, an empty criminal record, in other words, a no criminal record back in Haiti. And it's right now it's impossible to get that documentation out of the country because the state has completely uh, uh, crumbled in Haiti. So anyway, that's um, the question that we, that's the situation that we faced uh, with uh, these um, squatters in Curitiba, which is the state capital. Just to say that here in Brazil, there are two different normative realities. I understand your position. It's a defensible position. In Brazil, um, political rights in the strict sense requires, uh, would require a constitutional change. There was a proposal to change the constitution by Senator Aloysio Nunes for foreign residents to take part in municipal elections, which happens in the European Union. But that constitutional amendment did not uh, go ahead. But to uh, raise your voice in a critical way, to express yourself in a rally, in a demonstration, and even under the previous law, when there were these, uh, um, when there were these clear, um, then when there were these clear guidelines saying that you couldn't create associations, you could not take part in political activities. Back then already case law was already saying no, that uh, the courts were saying no, that the constitution allowed uh, foreign residents to express themselves politically. So, so I respect your position to say that if you can't vote, you don't want to call for the downfall of the government. But right now, what I want to tell you is that the fact that you don't have the right to vote does not preclude you from manifesting publicly uh, um, your political criticism. I was an electoral uh, prosecutor. I stayed six years talking only, uh, uh, working only with electoral law. There has been some discussion about this in the past and the presidents have always separated the two things. Even though you don't have the right to vote, yes, you have the right to create an association, you have the right to have political positions. So I think it's a personal decision. You should 
uh, demonstrate politically if you want. And of course, I am presupposing autonomy. There's no compulsion. There's no, nobody can be forced to go on a demonstration, of course. There's a freedom to demonstrate. There's a freedom of expression, a freedom. But you're not forced to uh, criticize any anything or anyone. So the right to not uh, uh, express a political opinion is, is also protected. So people have their individual autonomy, of course. Thank you, Professor. Unfortunately, we have to close. In Brazil, it's uh, 12. 15 and we need to close so i want to thank you sincerely i'm everything is uh, recorded here then we are going to post it in our channel so if you want you have the opportunity to reflect once again personally i give you my testimonial i am from comparative literature cultural studies and when i look at this um this from a different point of view, it's a very enriching opportunity and makes dialogue even more interesting. So I want to thank you once again. It's, for me, it's the second time with some of you. It's the first time with others. I thank Professor Manuela for the dedication, for the opportunity. Also, I think the opportunity to thank the translators knowing of the difficulty, the challenge, which is to translate this uh, speeches. I think all the participants, now we have 49 participants, but there was a moment when we reached 69 people watching. So I want to thank each one of the guest speakers for bringing their knowledge, uh, sharing their information with us. So I want to close the session, wish you a wonderful week, a wonderful uh, holiday season. So see you next time. I hope we meet very soon again. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see you all again. Bye.